in this video, I'm not real sure what it is that God wants me to highlight. So I, I know what he's doing when he does that. He just wants to reveal it as it goes. He's been putting Ze the book of Zechariah on me for a while, and today he's putting it on me even more heavily, um, even that he had me mark it. And so today when I come to, my, come to the word, he tells me, go to Zechariah. So now's the time. So I'm just going to read straight through this book and starting at Zechariah 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your ancestors? Then they repented and said, the Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. So that is one of the passages that he's highlighting to me. Then they repented and said, the Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he has determined to do. Here's why I believe he's pressing that on me or the way that he's pressing it on me because I already know why he is pressing it. Because counterfeit Christianity likes to overlook this constantly. They say they believe in this word. They say that they believe in what God has established. And remember that counterfeit Christianity is in our hearts. That's where it begins. It's not that counterfeit Christianity is the fault of some church. Catholicism and the prostitutes are only able to have the power that they have because of the wickedness in the hearts of those who chase after that doctrine. That's where counterfeit Christianity is. It's in the heart of counterfeit Christians. And in the heart of counterfeit Christians is this lip service that they believe in the word, but they don't ever want to consider what the word says about what happens if we disobey? I mean, it's pretty brutal. If you read about what happens when we disobey, it is incredibly brutal. I mean, all you have to do is read Leviticus 26, the second half of Leviticus 26, to see that it's pretty brutal. And of course, other places in the word as well. And if you look at the history of what God's done to his people for disobedience, for turning away from him, he, send them, he sends them into captivity. How many times did his people go into captivity just within the Bible. And so do you think something's changed since the Bible until now? No, he sent his people into captivity. So people get really upset about me talking about World War II as being judgment from the Lord, but I've illustrated that very clearly, that we all turned away. And those who received the worst persecution reformed Judaism. That's what they were doing. They were reforming Judaism in Germany, a movement called Wissenschaft des Judentums. And so what have we done as Christians, as Gentiles who were engrafted in, what have we done to his word? Judgment's coming. And it just so happens that he talks about that. He talks about if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to die by the sword, by the sword, they will be killed. Guess what? Those are his people he's talking about. We got to get it together if we want that to pass over us. And yes, God's wrath is going to pass over us. But for those who took that long to get there, who are going to be here during the Antichrist reign, if they are to die by the sword, by the sword, they will be killed. If they are to go into captivity, into captivity, they will go. You understand? Whatever it takes to bring us into position, well, that's what's going to happen. And so again, Zechariah 1 verse 6 says, but did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your ancestors? Then they repented and said, the Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. It's going to happen again. It has happened. And it wasn't just those who were in Germany, although they received the worst of it. But it was also all of the judgment that was leading up to that for having forsaken what God established in pursuing science, the false God of science. We, he gave us plenty of opportunity from the time that this was being built, that philosophers came in and they started, you know, doing away with what God established and establishing their own ideas. And what do we do in school? 
sit around and talk about those ideas. Why? Why are we doing that? Then somewhere along the way, the transmutation of species was introduced, and that set the stage for Darwinism to just be readily accepted. And, and the origin of the species sold out in one single day, you guys. That's how powerful. That is how powerful that wickedness chasing after this false god. We don't want a god who created us. We don't want a god who's sovereign over us. We want to be our own god. We want to have evolved. We want what the world has, right? What do the Israelites say? We don't, want a, we don't want a prophet. We want a human king. We don't want God over us. We want a human over us. Same kind of thing. We don't want God over us. We don't want to have to defer to him to heal us. We want man. Let man heal us. So by the time Darwinism comes around, now everybody is readily accepting these ideas that we have not been created, that we evolved. We're our own guides. We are an evolving, you know, superpower species. Our own higher power, as a matter of fact. Have you not heard people say stuff like that? No, God, we want a higher power, whatever that is. And totally eliminating all of the things that were important to God. All of his desires, all of his values, that we be good to our, one another, that we're good to our neighbors, that we're even good to the foreigners. We leave, you know, our, we don't tend our, uh, our vines and our trees. We leave fruit kind of hanging over so that the foreigner can come and be blessed through us. I mean, that's not just a command, that's a mentality. You understand? And so when origin of the species was, it was introduced, that eliminated everything. It, it was just a complete game changer. And so within 100 years, God starts bringing all of this crazy judgment. And he brought it through World War II, but he started out by bringing Spanish influenza, the stock market crash, the depression, I mean, there were things that were building up to this. You understand? He was warning. And same thing goes for now. I mean, have we not been warned? Are we not being warned through the earth? Did he not tell us when you see these things, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to understand from them. He's a God of his word and he is going to bring judgment on his people again. And those who are hostile towards him, if you read Leviticus 26, you're going to see that he says, Here's what I'm going to do. And then he lays it out. And then he says, and if you're still hostile towards me, here's what else I'm going to do. And I'm going to punish you for your sins seven times over. So judgment will continually increase. And you know what? You can call it whatever you want. You can defer to any false god that you want. You want to call it global warming? All right. I mean, that's your prerogative. You want to call it COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, monkey pox, whatever it is that the world calls it. That's your prerogative. God calls it plagues. And he calls it drought, famine, hail. He says, when I send these things, if you return to me, I will heal you. And if you don't, I will be hostile towards you. Verse 7, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Sh Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. During the night, I had a vision, and there before me was a man mounted on a red horse, he was standing among the myrtle tree trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. I asked, what are these, my lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. The man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, we have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been so angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel who was speaking to me said, proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, and I'm very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further, this is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and, Jeru and choose Jerusalem. Okay, so let's back up a little bit to verse 16. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy and there my house will be rebuilt. You know, there's reference in Daniel to the reconsecration of the temple. So after the witnesses are thrown down or after the sanctuary is thrown down and the daily sacrifice is abolished, right? From the time that they started their ministry, 
2,300 days after that, the temple will be reconsecrated. And you see this theme. You see this theme with Hanukkah, festival of dedication, that the temple was rededicated, right? When the Greeks had defiled it and they brought their pagan gods and um, the Maccabees fought to rededicate the temple. You see that theme continuously. I mean, you see it even in the physical temple. From the first temple being thrown down to then building the second temple to then the second temple being defiled and then rededicating the second temple, that same symbolism is happening in the third temple, which is us. The third temple being the foundation, right? The cornerstone of Christ, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the witnesses, and then the temple is thrown down and then he's rebuilding that temple, right? So right now we know that he's talking about the temple being rebuilt with the witnesses because you're going to see in chapter four that he's talking about the witnesses. But I just want you to have that in your understanding so that you're continually trying to understand with spiritual eyes and a spiritual mind and conforming to God's heart because he's the only one who can reveal it to you. If you're doing this with carnal eyes and a carnal mind, you're not going to understand. The temple is being rebuilt by Christ. And you're going to see in Zechariah 4 that it talks about the hands of Zerubbabel built this temple laid the foundation of this temple, and he will finish it. So you know how we say like we built something with blood, sweat, and tears? This is like literally building with blood, sweat, and tears. This is like the lives of God's people building this temple. Not only like their lives being poured out, but also their lives being sacrificed. I would say that's the true meaning of blood, sweat, and tears. So I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt. Don't think of this as Jerusalem, the literal Jerusalem, land of Jerusalem. We too are Jerusalem. So don't think of it that way because this is what counterfeit Christianity is doing. They're pointing to Israel and they're saying, well, when the temple starts being rebuilt, well, you know what? Those who are looking for that are going to be greatly deceived. Is that land in any condition right now to be building a temple? You think it's going to get better? There's thousands of years of war happening over there. So you tell me, is a temple going to be rebuilt over there? No. Christ said, no. even if there is a temple over there, that's not his temple. God chooses the temple. He's the one who chooses to dwell in it. And you see that all the way back to the first temple when Solomon dedicated the first temple. You see that he dedicated the temple to God and then God had to respond to him and say, I've chosen this place. I've chosen this place for my name. My heart is going to be here. I will watch over this temple. He has to choose it. But Peter said that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. Paul said that we are being fitted together to rise as a holy temple before the Lord. And Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, a time is coming and has now come when you will not worship in Jerusalem or in the temple. That's clear. It's clearly established. So then he says, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, Immediately when I read that, and there's a couple of re- references to the measuring line, what God puts on my heart is Isaiah 28, 17. Actually, let's go back to verse 16, because he's talking about the temple. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. So I love that he says for a sure foundation, because a physical temple can we be wiped away, right? The foundation can be wiped away, the entire temple. But he says here, this is a sure foundation. Jesus Christ is a sure foundation on this temple. If Jesus Christ is a sure foundation on this temple, let me ask you something. Why would you ever want to return to a physical temple, (laughs) to a building structure as the temple? It's already been decided. And this is the best temple. I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. I will make justice the measuring line. So again, this is the reason we're reading this is because in Zechariah, he says, and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. But he already told us in Isaiah, you know, verse uh, 17 I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Now, the plumb line, as I've explained to you in previous videos, the plumb line also referred to as the capstone in Zechariah 4. The plumb line ensures that everything is standing straight. It's, It's making sure that everything has 
correct angles and lines. Righteousness is the plumb line. Additionally, he refers to his witnesses as being the plumb line. His witnesses are the plumb line. His witnesses are the capstone. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. So what is he saying here? Because he says, go around and measure the temple. And you're going to see in the next chapter, in chapter two, he's going to start talking to us about the measuring line. He's going to start saying when, when he's asked, do you still want us to fast on these days? He's going to say, have you fasted for me? Have you fasted for yourself? Do you even get why it is that I want you to fast? And then he starts talking about justice. So it's not that those who are fasting on a regular basis, those who are fasting twice a week and they're saying, oh, look at me, I fast twice a week, right? Jesus rebuked these things, those who are lording this over others, but they're not even getting it. Like they're not even, they're, they don't get it at all. Why it is that God wants us to do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. I said chapter two, but I meant chapter seven. So we'll discuss that when we get there. But what we want to understand is that this is the way that God is determining who's inside of the temple and who's not. Justice will be the measuring line and righteousness will be the plumb line. Righteousness is what is going to keep this temple straight. And there's an association between that plumb line and the witnesses. And so we want to understand what the witnesses are doing. The witnesses are teaching and preaching righteousness. They are restoring the word and the gospel of Christ. Zechariah chapter one, verse 17, proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. Then I looked up and there before me were four horns. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these? He answered me, these are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So the horns are the kingdoms, right? The kings or the kingdoms. That's what a horn is in the word. Well, not always. Sometimes a horn is what is anointing, right? Like the uh, oil is held in the horn and the horn of oil was poured over Dave, David in order to anoint him. Sometimes the horn is referring to strength, but that's not what scattered the people of Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. We know that it was kings or kingdoms. Then the Lord showed me the four craftsmen. I asked, what are these coming to do? He answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw the, down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. Then I looked up and there before me was a man with a measuring line. There's that word again, or that term again, a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered me to measure Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. So what is he doing there? Is he literally going to measure Jerusalem? No, he's going to measure who's in the temple, who's in this city, who's included, who are the people of God. While the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet him and said to him, run, tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord. And I will be its glory within. So understand the temple is going to be reconsecrated 2,300 days after the witnesses have begun their testifying. And so you know that that's going to include all those who have, who, um, have lived righteous lives, the apostles, um, all of the servants of God, all the prophets. And it's also going to include the witnesses. And it's going to include a multitude in white robes. So this makes total sense, doesn't it? And so the multitude in white robes are going to be that final harvesting in. In the temple, as spoken of in Daniel, 2,300 days after the witnesses begin their test testifying, that temple is going to be reconsecrated. So that's the third temple will have been rededicated to the Lord. And then, of course, John sees in the next age, that, the, that God and the Lamb are its temple. And why is that? You need to understand that. It's important that you understand that. The reason for that is because a temple is not a temple without God's presence. And so if we're dwelling among, if he's dwelling among us, he's the temple. So here we see that with the third temple, you know, prior to the next age, I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. 
Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape, you who live in daughter Babylon. All right. That sound familiar to you at all? If you've been listening to my videos for a while, that should absolutely sound familiar to you. You should know exactly where that is. Come, Zion, escape, you who live in daughter Babylon. Now, let me ask you something. Is he referring to a land? No, he's referring to his people. So it should not trip you up that when he talks about Jerusalem, that he's not literally talking about the land of Jerusalem. He's talking about us. When he talks about Zion, he's talking about us. When he talks about Israel, he's talking about us. And he's letting us know the criteria by which we're included in that category. That if you want to be included, that righteousness is the plumb line and justice is the measuring line. You're included as long as you are uh, engaging in these behaviors, as long as you are merciful, as long as you give justice. But if you're shady, if you have your church ethics and your business ethics, you're not included in that. If you have your church God, and then you have your science God in your discipline. <laughs> I don't think so, guys. You can't be included in that. So he says, come Zion, escape you who live in daughter Babylon. When you look in Revelation eighteen six, what do you hear? Well, in verse 17, you see, excuse me, in chapter 17, you see that he's talking about Babylon the Great, who is the mother of all prostitutes. Babylon consists of that mother and her prostitute daughters that bore out of her. Remember, a woman in the, a woman is often used in the Bible in order to represent a church. There's one good church and many bad churches. Those many bad churches are Babylon. And so, right after he gets done talking about Babylon, then he in verse in chapter eighteen, verse six says, actually, let's back up to verse four. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, "Come out of her, my people." Who's he talking about? He's talking about Babylon. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Now, does that sound like they are plundering her? They are paying her back? They are turning on her? The reason I'm pointing that out is because we're about to read about that. Okay, so going back to Zechariah chapter 2, verse 7, Come, Zion, escape, you who live in daughter Babylon. For this is what the Lord Almighty says. After the glorious one has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye, of his eye. I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Now, if we're a slave to God, these are slaves to her, right? Their slaves will plunder them. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Now, let me ask you something. Those of you who've come out of counterfeit Christianity in your heart, and you've also come out of counterfeit Christian churches, you feel like you might want to plunder those who led you astray? Now, I'm not necessarily talking about the people. I'm talking about that system. Don't you feel angry about that? Don't you feel angry that you were deceived and that that even exists? Of course you do. This is a form of vengeance. When God says, pay her back, you know what he's saying, right? He's saying, plunder her. This is my vengeance for you. Come out of her and expose her. What am I doing with you? I do it all the time in all these videos, right? In, in the books as well. I expose it for what it is. I say, this is what goes on in counterfeit Christianity. You need to come out of Babylon. I'm paying her back right now. And listen, although I'm pretty ticked off about um, and grieved about what I was exposed to within the sciences, what I was exposed to within counterfeit Christianity and cults. I'm really not focused on that. I am paying her back, but the thing that I'm focused on is the truth. I'm focused on building the kingdom of God and I'm focused on the truth and I'm exposing. I am paying her back, but understand like this is where our hearts are at. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we go, that we're like actively going after them and like warring against certain people or warring against those churches, that's a waste of our energy. We're here to harvest. So for that reason, I'm not sitting here, you know, focusing my energy on exposing Mormonism that I grew up in or exposing, you know, the counterfeit church that I went to in graduate school. I don't really care about them. Unless it's going to help one of you, I'm not going to go there. The truth is what matters. So I don't focus on the lie. I focus on the truth. So you see this mirroring. It's so cool. In Revelation 18, 
of God saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given, pay her back double for what she's done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I'll never mourn. And then in verse uh, chapter 22 of Revelation, you see God encouraging us and telling us, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I'll give to each person according to what they have done. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you the testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And so here in Zechariah verse uh, chapter 2, verse 10, you see that same pattern being reiterated. Him saying, come out of her, come out of Babylon. And then in verse 10, he says, shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Oh my goodness. This is how you know you're in him. When your soul is like screaming for that, <laughs> when you read this and this like lights you up, that's how you know you're in him. Because I read that and I just think like I'm just pulling on that. That's what I look forward to every day. But understand, I'm not just going, oh, praise the Lord. Come, come. You know, like stuff like that really gets under my skin. I got to tell you, because that's a dime a dozen. I see people do that all the time. And really what they're doing is like they're praising the words of man. They're not talking about, usually it's in reference to them like glorifying something that someone else is saying about God. And they, and they think, and they say things like, I receive that. I receive that. Let me tell you how you receive that. Cause that is counterfeit Christianity saying stuff like that. And just, you know, getting all excited about what God's going to do for you. That isn't what I'm talking about. That's not what I feel when I read this. What I feel when I read this is I'm going to rest from my labor because I am laboring. And I'm going to tell you how I receive that. I receive that by giving him all rights to me, by understanding my covenant with him, by taking him at his word. And so the next chapter, we're actually going to talk a little bit about the covenant because that's the very next thing he starts talking about. Chapter three. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. Now listen carefully. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you walk, if, all right, if then covenant, if you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, uh, what do you mean? But counterfeit Christianity has taught me that you did everything. Nope. If you walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, the requirements of his covenant, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. All right, let me ask you something. Are we there yet? Are we sitting, inviting our neighbor to sit under our vine and fig tree? We're not there yet. So he has not removed the sin of the land in a single day, but he will. And in that day, we will invite our neighbor to sit under our vine and fig tree. First, we have to obey 
and fulfill the requirements, keep the requirements of his covenant. All right, now we're going to talk about the witnesses. So I want you to understand that this is, this is what's happening with us. When he is making a covenant with us, he is washing away our sins through baptism. It's symbolic, right? But we sin after that. We don't know how to remain clean. We're given an opportunity. We are made clean, then we're given an opportunity, but we don't stay clean. We're given an opportunity to continue to be sanctified through his Holy Spirit, to be built, to repent, to be made clean, purified, made spotless, and refined. And we do that in this if-then covenant. If we obey and we keep his requirements, then we will be saved. And he will remove the sin of the land, the land that is within that measuring line, in a single day, he will remove that sin. Chapter four, then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a gold lamp, solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what they are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to the shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Talking about Jesus, who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen camps, capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Okay, and so where it says capstone, the reason we know that that's the plumb line is because when, you, when you're looking in your Bible, you're going to see that there is a, um, you know, if you have the same NIV version, for example, you're going to see a little D and you're going to look down at the footnote and it's going to say, or the plumb line. And so this is, again, the plumb line is righteousness. That's what keeps this temple straight. All right. So I want to back up a little bit to verse seven, where it says, what are you mighty mountain before Zerubbabel? You'll become level ground. If you remember, uh, a few weeks back, I did a video on Ezekiel 30. Eight and 39. And in that video, we discussed Gog, G O G, and Magog, and the meaning of Gog being covering or mountain. This is some sort of power, and it is covering up for something. So, again, God uses a lot of different things to describe uh, his church Zion, Jerusalem, Israel, a temple. He also uses many things to describe counterfeit Christianity, Babylon, Gog, the mother of all prostitutes and her prostitute children. I mean, he uses a lot of different things, right? So he's using Gog, this power, this covering for something, but it's a mighty mountain, isn't it? Or at least it thinks it is. And yet it's going to be stripped bare. It's not just Mormonism. It's not just Jehovah's Witness. It's not just Catholicism. It's not just the obvious cults. It is all of counterfeit Christianity. It is the harlot and all of those prostitutes that bore out of her and everyone who has included themselves in that. And how have they included themselves in that? By what is in their heart, by what they have accepted and believed in their heart. This is why, even though people get upset, I don't stop preaching this. I don't stop talking about the lie of that unilateral covenant. It is a lie. It is an if then covenant. And if you don't get that, you need to read the word. You need to see what Christ has said. Even just what Christ said when he was here, even just what he said, but that's not even acknowledging the entire word. That's not acknowledging from beginning to end. And even when Christ was here, he said, don't think I've come to abolish the law. Not one stroke of a pen, not one jot or tittle will be removed from the law I came here to fulfill. And he didn't come to fulfill the entire law, everything that's commanded of us. He came to fulfill the law, meaning that you couldn't have done this on your own. 
I fail to understand where counterfeit Christianity then deduces that therefore you don't have to do anything. That's crazy. That's never been God's heart. I mean, what are we doing here? Otherwise, we would have just been taken up. As it is, there's a lot that we need to do here. And that is evident throughout the word. And it is evident that we have not been saved. Otherwise, Christ would not say to the churches, you're about to lose your lampstand. I find your deeds to be unfinished in the sight of my God. You've done this, this, and this. I acknowledge that, but your deeds are unfinished in the sight of my God. And so you're about to you lose your lampstand. Well, what's the lampstand? What's the lampstand if it doesn't represent something that has to do with fulfilling the covenant and in order to be saved? The lampstand, as it is, is that purpose for which you've been set apart, that testimony that he's been building in you throughout your life that maybe you didn't realize that he's been building that through you and you thought those were all traumas because you turned to the world to explain that to you. That's what that is. And if you turn to him, he will heal you and he will minister to you and then he will minister through you. He will place his light on that lampstand to be the light of the world. That's your covenant. That is what is required of you if you are going to be saved. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the, go the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. So this obviously is talking about the two witnesses. Uh, that's how we know that the plumb line is referring to the two witnesses the two witnesses, do not misunderstand, are not two people. They are the 144,000 of Revelation, 144,000 in the entire world. So when God said that there was an apostasy that was going to take place, that the gospel was, you know, people were going to reject the gospel and that there was going to be counterfeit Christianity here, he wasn't kidding. There are only 144,000 witnesses who will serve in that capacity. Now, don't misunderstand based on false doctrine from Jehovah's Witness, for example, there's not only 144,000 who are going to be saved. That, you know, Revelation makes that very clear. I don't know where anyone would ever not understand that if they're actually reading the word. The 144,000 are the witnesses, the multitude in white robes that no one could count will also be saved. If you'd like to know more about that, you can type in those keywords like multitude in white robes or 144,000 and you will find videos on this channel. You can also type in witnesses, and that should also pull some things up for you. Chapter 5. I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll, 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that's going out over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished according to what it says on the other Everyone who swears falsely will be banished. Okay, so here comes the justice. Here's the justice that he's been talking about. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of, of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. So here I'm just going to kind of tell you my process as we're reading this because here, as I read this, what, what comes to my heart and the mind of my heart is that of Passover. That's what this reminds me of, is that there's this separation. He knows how to identify, okay? So it's not that he actually needed that blood of the lamb to be over the door. He was doing that symbolically for our sake in order to understand how we're sealed. He's perfectly capable of distinguishing who's his and who's not. But the thing that stands out to me is that there's some sort of a curse. There's something that's going to come on these people and they are going to be destroyed, right? So does this not, is this not sounding like Passover? He sends the destroying angel to destroy the firstborn in every house. So he's capable of distinguishing who's the firstborn in every house, who's obeyed him and who hasn't. He's able to do that. And so there's a curse that's going to go out and it's going to enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by his name. And it will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. We're a house. I don't know if this literally means that he's going to do that to their physical house, but I tend to believe that he's going to do it to them. Verse 5. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, look up and see what is appearing. I asked, what is it? He replied, it's a basket. And he added, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. 
Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat a woman. He, sa- he said, this is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed its lead cover down on it. Then I looked up, and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where are they taking the basket, I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. When the house is ready, the basket will be set there in its place. All right, so don't misunderstand. We, you know, you don't want to say that Babylon is Catholicism. You know, we have a beef with Catholicism because Catholicism started that whole mess. But understand that it's the spirit behind Catholicism that has done that. And so Catholicism is the harlot. That's papal Rome is going to rise. We know that. I already demonstrated that in a video between Daniel and Revelation. By process of elimination, we know it's papal Rome. That is the Antichrist. That is the harlot that's riding the beast. That doesn't mean that her prostitute daughters aren't going to completely go along with it. So that is the mother of all prostitutes. That is Babylon the Great. But it's not Babylon as an entirety. The entirety of Babylon is found in the mother the Catholic harlot church and the prostitutes that bore out of her, the churches that bore out of her through the reformation prior to Catholicism. There was no established institution of organized religions and churches. It just was not a thing. We understood that the, that the church is in the believer who worships God in truth and in spirit. And so what is Babylon representing? As an entirety, what is it representing? It is representing counterfeit Christianity. The seal of God is what you have accepted in your heart. The mark of the beast is what you have accepted in your heart. If you believe in any other gospel than the one that's been preached to you in the word, you have believed in vain. There's one true gospel. There are many false gospels. If you accept counterfeit Christianity, a counterfeit gospel into your heart. That's on you. That's on you. That's your heart. If you are accepting a unilateral covenant, thinking that you don't owe Christ anything and you're just waiting to be picked up, that's on you. That's in your heart. I've done so many videos on here that I don't even feel an obligation to explain it to anyone anymore. It's what I have found is either people can accept it and go and pursue God's spirit on their own and scripture on their own. I mean, I've, I've explained it ad infinitum on these videos. And so if someone can't accept that, then that's on them. It's in their heart because you have to be able to reconcile all of scripture, not cherry pick the ones that you choose to believe. That is not a gospel that will save. So we're seeing here in chapter five that the woman in a basket is going to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. She's being taken to the country of Babylonia to build a house for it. A house will be built for counterfeit Christianity. That's all I know right now. I don't know what it's going to look like. All I know is that papal Rome is going going to be involved. Chapter six, I looked up again and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses and the second black, the third white, And the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. The one with the black horse, horses is going towards the north country and the one with the white horses toward the west and the one with the dappled horses toward the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. Then he called to me, look, those going toward the north country have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. The word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest Joshua, son of Josadak. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from this place. Now we know that the branch is Christ. He will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. 
It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two. The crown will be given to Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, son of Zephaniah, as a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away will come and build the temple of the Lord, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Okay, so again, he pulls them out from all the nations, right? They're going to come from far away in order to build the house of the Lord. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Again, contingency of the covenant. If you diligently obey the Lord your God. Chapter 7. Now here I just want to point something out. In my NIV version, the heading is justice and mercy, not fasting. That's in addition to the scroll. So these headlines, you know, sometimes they can be kind of helpful in order to kind of follow things, but I don't really agree with them as a whole. I don't believe there were headlines in the original Hebrew transcripts, so why would we add headlines? And this headline is deceiving, and I've pointed it out to you in other uh, passages of scripture as well. Justice and mercy, not fasting. So basically what this is saying is that God doesn't want us to fast. It's very misleading. God is not saying in this chapter, so I want you to pay attention. He's not saying that he doesn't want us to fast. What he's saying is you're not getting it. You haven't understood why it is that you're supposed to fast. When we truly fast, we return to him. It's not about just withholding from our bodies. Anyone can do that. But we're withholding from our bodies in order to circumcise from the flesh, discipline our physical flesh, and then get into the heart and spirit and actually rend our heart to him. That's how we return to him. And so when we return to him, then we begin to follow that covenant. We begin to obey that covenant. We begin to conform our heart to his heart. And so this right here is very, very misleading. I don't want you to think that fasting is not important to God. Fasting is incredibly important to God. You know, this was in Zechariah. After Zechariah, Christ is saying some of these spirits don't come out, but by prayer and fasting alone. So how can anyone say that fasting is not important to God? Of course it is, but we need to understand why. Why are we fasting? What is important to his heart? Chapter 7. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev. The people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regum Melech, together with their men, to entreat the Lord by asking the priests of the house of the Lord Almighty and the prophets, should I mourn and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? Are these not the words the Lord proclaimed through the earlier prophets when Jerusalem and its surrounding towns were at rest and prosperous and the Negev and the western foothills were settled? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. So let me kind of spell this out for you. Let me give you an example. Technically, I would begin be considered a widow or the fatherless, right? I don't have a husband. I don't have a father. The father I had wasn't so good. So I'd be in that category. When people come to my home to give me an estimate on doing a job or something like that, they always take advantage. They always, always take advantage. They have their church ethics and they have their business ethics. You know, as successful as I was in business, God really blessed my business. I never did that. I never did that. I never set out to take advantage of anybody. In, if anything, I did the opposite. But they don't hesitate to do it with me. They see my home. They make an assumption that I must be independently wealthy or something. And they have no clue that I'm living on my savings right now. It's something to consider because we've been taught in the world that we have to do those things in order to get by, that we have to do those things in order to be successful. That's a lie. That is an absolute lie. If you believe in the word, if you believe in God, he says that he will bless you for mercy, for obedience, for justice, for honoring him with the first of your crops. Something to consider. And let me tell you something. 
I'm not talking about just people who like, you know, claim to be worldly or something. These are people who claim to be Christian. God established for us to treat each other with care, with love, with honesty, with justice. And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says, said, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. So treat each other well. Do you see how the mentality has completely shifted and how it would shift from what God established about taking care of each other to this scientific way of thinking, which is origin of the species, you evolved, and actually you're just here to compete. You're here to look out for number one. These are the ethics that you are to live by. In fact, if you don't live by those ethics, you won't be able to survive. That's what the world says. You know, I shared with you a while back that there were, that, that I had been in contact with someone who was in school in the sciences and there was a monetary requirement, a monetary quota for them to produce, which was leading to overdiagnosis. It's actually still in effect right now. Leading to overdiagnosis, causing people to cut into a person's body based on the criteria that of, of money, making money for the institution because this is a training institution. This person is still in school and is being threatened that if they don't produce a monetary quota, that they will not com- con- uh, complete their graduate training. How much is a human life worth, right? And when that was brought to other people within that field, I'm going to tell you what they said. Well, what are we supposed to do? This is common knowledge. This is what people do in this field. I don't see what's ro- what the problem is, what's wrong with what they're doing. We have a lot of loans to pay back. I- I'm not even joking that these were the responses of the people within that discipline. And not one news source would pick it up. The governing agencies that are supposed to regulate them, they wouldn't do anything about it. So I'm just waiting for God to do something about it. He will in his own time. But that's what you need to understand. That's what you need to understand. When you go to one of those so-called experts... That's their mentality. That's how they look at you. That's what that field teaches. And just because someone went into a so-called helping, helping discipline, I can tell you from personal experience that I, I don't really know many people within the field that I went into, which is, you know, psychology, mental health. You're supposed to care about these people. I don't know many people who have their scruples about them within that field. I don't know many people who have even experienced healing. I don't even think that I could tell you one, not one person who has something to give, who should be in that position of authority telling other people, here's how you heal. That's my honest opinion. Same thing with counterfeit Christianity. I could count on one hand the people I know who are actually doing the work, who I could say they really have a heart for God. Verse 11, but they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they would not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations where they were strangers The land they left behind them was so desolate that no one traveled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. This is shaped up to be a pretty long uh, video, so I'm actually going to stop right there. I really don't feel God pressing on me to go any further, but I think um, if I were to say what the message is here, that he's pressing on me or that he's, uh, you know, demonstrating that he's showing me, is the process of building his temple is very much integrated with returning to the purity of his word, returning to the purity of his truth, coming out of Babylon. We all, myself included, we all have been infected by Babylon. Our hearts have been infected by counterfeit Christianity, and we need to find our way back. And one of the things that I demonstrated to you with regard to the 144,000 is that they are described as virgins and not having defiled themselves with women. And I've told you many times in the word that women are used in order to describe church or doctrine. One good church, many bad churches. One true doctrine, many false doctrines. Those witnesses, those 144,000 are chosen because they did not defile themselves. They are not physical virgins. 
They are virgins. They've maintained the purity of their hearts. Doesn't mean they're men either. Just because they didn't defile themselves with women because women refers to many bad churches. So they didn't defile themselves with that false doctrine. They didn't defile themselves with counterfeit Christianity. That's why they are chosen. All of us are going to have to be in that position. Some of us are going to go through more in order to get there. That's what I feel him highlighting for me today. And the message that I, that I hear him saying is come out, come out of her, have a heart for him. And then you got to demonstrate your heart for him. If your heart is truly for him, then you're going to pursue what he wants from you. You're going to want to understand his heart. You're going to pursue his heart and you're going to conform your heart to his. And again, this, you know, in chapter seven, this theme that's being highlighted of fasting, of justice and mercy, when you're fasting, when you're feasting, it needs to be done to him. Otherwise, as Paul says, you have believed in vain. If you can't do these things, if you don't believe in this gospel and you don't believe in this covenant and you don't believe in the things that he has said you have to become and you have to do, you've believed in vain. So do everything that you can to stand and to not be one of those people. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.